Instrumentation Efficiency at the Speed of Understanding, Chapter 2. In Chapter 1, we gained understanding of the principles for instrumentation to enhance our effectiveness in root canal preparations. Now in Chapter 2, let's expand this understanding and leverage it to gain efficiency in practice. Dr. John McSpadden has completed a tremendous body of research on how best to accomplish effective instrumentation with the least amount of risk, time, and effort. He wrote and organized this presentation from the perspective that improving efficiency of instrumentation is the simplest and most cost-effective way to improve a dental practice. So, what is efficiency in our practice? Well, efficiency is a measurable concept determined by the level of performance that uses the least amount of time and effort to achieve the same or better results. It's a cost-free investment with compound returns on our most valuable asset, time. Patients appreciate the professionalism and convenience of spending less time in the chair, and the benefits for the dentist add up quickly. But is it really worth the time and effort required to refine the principles of your current instrumentation technique? What if the slightest change could save you an entire month's worth of work over the course of one year? What would the value of such a proposition be? Suppose an endodontist saved 10 minutes with each patient through a slight gain in efficiency. If they saw only six patients in one day, that would amount to one extra hour each day. Within 200 days, that would amount to 25 working days. That's five weeks of saved time that might otherwise have been wasted. Before we go any further, let's take a moment to review the physics for file anatomy relationships discussed in Chapter 1. 1. The torque required to rotate a file varies directly with the surface area of the file's engagement. 2. Resistance to torsional stress decreases directly with the decrease in the square of the file's diameter. 3. Fatigue of a file increases with the square of the file's diameter. And 4. Fatigue of a file increases with the degree of curvature and the number of rotations. Now let's review the three principles for instrumentation before we expand upon them just a bit. If you'll recall, the first three principles are 1. Advance a file into the canal with no more than 1 mm increments with insert-withdraw pecking type motions and resist any screwing in forces to 1 mm as well. Two. Advancement into the canal should be able to occur at a rate of approximately a half millimeter per second with each insertion without increasing the force for insertion. If this cannot be accomplished, immediately change to a file having a different taper. 3. When changing files, always change to a file having a different taper. Now we'll introduce two new principles to help us refine choices for our approach. Number 4. Engage no more than 6 millimeters of a file if engaged in a curvature, the exception being a size 2004 or smaller. And five, in most curvatures, the file diameter should be limited to a 60 for an 02 taper, a 55 for an 04, and a 50 for an 06. Let's take a closer look at the first new principle, number four. Engage no more than 6 millimeters of a file if it's engaged in a curvature. Files larger than a 2004 have a diameter 6 millimeters from their tip that is often larger than you might expect, thus making them more susceptible to fatigue. In calculating the diameter of a 2004 file 6 millimeters from its tip, for instance, we know the diameter to be 44. We also know from our file anatomy relationships that the fatigue of a file increases with the square of its diameter, meaning that a size 40 is four times as likely to fatigue as a size 20 and will do so twice as fast. Our testing indicates that any file size larger than this risks failure unnecessarily. Even heat-treated files of this size are at risk as their increased flexibility and resistance to cyclic fatigue inherently reduce their torsional strength, increasing the likelihood of distortion or separation. So if we cannot instrument the entire 6 mm with one file, then we should partially enlarge the curvature to decrease the amount of engagement for the next file. 
The last new principle we've added to our list is number five, which states, in most curvatures, the file diameter should be limited to a 60 for an 02 taper, a 55 for an 04, and a 50 for an 06. So why is it necessary for different tapers to have different diameter limitations for files engaged in curvatures? Remember, resistance to torsional stress increases directly with the square of the file's diameter. Since the diameters change more gradually in smaller tapers, torsional stresses are distributed over more of the working surface. And since diameters change more abruptly along larger tapers, the stresses concentrate over less of the working surface, increasing the likelihood of file failure. Because diameters are greater within larger tapered files, cyclic fatigue may also become a threat for file failure. Our testing indicates that the most effective sequence for maximizing efficiency and minimizing risks during instrumentation includes these four steps. Determine the length of each canal that is straight. Then, enlarge the straight portion of the canal to the extent that any subsequent file used apical to this portion will not engage within the straight portion. Next, determine the distance of the curvature to the apex or the working length minus the straight portion. And finally, determine the file sizes that can be used in and beyond the curvatures. Our first step is to create a visual image from the x-ray as a reference we can use throughout treatment. The average length of the crown for all teeth is approximately six millimeters. Visually extrapolate the estimated total length of the tooth in relation to a six millimeter crown. Note the position of any curvatures, any unique features, and the CEJ. In this x-ray, the total length appears to be about three crown lengths, or 18 millimeters. A curvature in the MB root appears to be at approximately 10 millimeters. Begin your access preparation directed towards the center of the CEJ. To illustrate the remaining steps, an actual tooth was carefully sectioned to expose the widest diameters of the MB canal. Identify and establish access into the canal. How far you can insert a sharp explorer into the orifice of the canal is a good indication of what size opener is appropriate. As we saw before, a file with a small tip size in relation to a large taper can pose a risk if the force used to rotate the larger diameter portion of the working length is greater than the force required to break the tip should it become bound. Be sure to keep this in mind when selecting your initial file. The initial file can be advanced to its first resistance. Then it should be removed immediately. Note the canal diameters indicated alongside the canal. Very often, first resistance to your initial file will indicate a curvature, in this case a 2506. Now note the change in diameters where the file has engaged the canal. Remember the second rule for advancement. Advancement into the canal should be able to occur at a rate of approximately one half millimeter per second with each insertion and without increasing the force of insertion. When this can no longer be accomplished, immediately change the files. Resistance will have indicated that the file has encountered a curvature or a constriction or possibly that too much of it has become engaged. As we've clearly seen from our research, this graph indicates a difference in pressure when an obstruction is encountered by a file in a canal. Follow the initial file with a smaller file and advance it using a pecking motion to the first increase in resistance. If there is a curvature, this file will likely negotiate at least the first portion, in this case a 2502. Note again the change in diameters indicated alongside the canal. Now withdraw the file into the initial file's preparation and stop the rotation of the file. Since the file isn't engaged, if it meets any resistance short of its preparation, that position is the beginning of a curvature. You now have identified how much of the canal is straight. This determination is very important for minimizing file stresses during the remaining canal preparation.
the canal is now divided into the straight coronal zone and the curved apical zone. Before removing the file, be sure to record the length of the coronal zone. In the case of this illustration, the measurement was 15 millimeters. The coronal zone is straight and the easiest section to enlarge without the threat of file failure. Our objective at this point is to enlarge the coronal zone to the extent that the largest file used in the apical zone will not engage in the coronal zone. This avoids unnecessary stress on any file in the most menacing curved portion of the canal. To meet this objective, the diameter at the terminus of the coronal zone may need to be larger than expected. For the sake of this illustration, let's say we prepare the coronal zone with a 5506. We are now ready to establish our working length without any interference or engagement in the coronal zone. Now let's establish the full working length of the canal. If we subtract the coronal zone measurement from the total working length, we will have defined the apical zone measurement, or the length of the curvature. In determining which files should be used in the apical zone, we now need to apply our fifth principle. By knowing these diameter and taper limitations, we can formulate the length of any file that we should be able to use in the apical zone and avoid subjecting the file to unnecessary stress. That formula is diameter limitation minus file size divided by taper, and that will give us the length of the file that can be advanced into the apical zone. We can use this formula to determine the length of any file size we want for advancing safely toward our working length. By using the formula for our illustration, we can determine, for instance, if a 2504 can be taken to the length of the apical zone, or through the total working length. So can we use a 2504? For the 25 with an 04 taper, we see the diameter limitation is 55. Next we'll reference our file size, which is 25. and then the taper, which is 04. So 55 minus 25 divided by 4 equals 6, meaning we can safely instrument with a 2504 to the terminus of the apical zone. So what about a 2506? For the 2506 taper, you see the diameter limitation is 50. Of course, the size is 25, and the taper is an 06. So 50 minus 25 divided by 6 equals 4 millimeters. So we cannot safely instrument with the 2506 to our working length, 6 millimeters of which is in the apical zone. However, we can go 4 millimeters, which is just 2 millimeters shy of the terminus of the 6 millimeter apical zone. Although we certainly haven't covered every aspect for developing greater instrumentation efficiency, I hope we have at least shed some light on the rationales informing the steps of our own routines. Through understanding possibilities, efficiency and efficacy become routine. Thank you for your time and attention, and please always feel free to contact us.